Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm seeing some tired faces, so that might be related to the fact that we are having the event in Amsterdam. Now, let me start with an apology. So Bruno Jakob Feuerborn, DT's group CTO, wanted to be here today and actually present this keynote to you. Unfortunately, he had a similar problem as uh, Nelly Cruz was facing, and we still haven't provided the technology which helps you to be at two places at the same time. So unfortunately, Bruno could not be here today. Now, I'm introducing a new buzzword to you. Or is it a new hype? What is that, a software-defined operator? And why do we need to go down that route? Well, if we're looking around, the operators, I think, are truly challenged. So internet traffic growth is going to continue. Is it a factor of 10? Is it a factor of 50 until the end of the decade? Well, it doesn't matter. Because unfortunately, our networks today are not ready to support this growth. We will need to invest in our networks in order to support the growth moving forward. That's very clear. Unfortunately, the climate we're in is not very investment friendly. There's a lot of competition going on in the market today. We see huge market changes happening. We saw that happening in the US. We saw that happening here in Europe uh, just recently. Some news, uh, for example, in our largest country in Germany about some drastic changes in the operator landscape. And I would predict that this actually continues. So the competition definitely will continue. And I would say the expectation that the revenue per user goes up mm, is highly unlikely to happen. So we have to find a way actually to finance uh, this next development, this investment into our networks. And we have to find a way also to get more flexible because we also have the over-the-top players. It's, they're not necessarily a direct competitor in the market for us, but they might also be partners. The question is, are we flexible enough? Are we as operators fast enough in our time to market Yes, in our time to revenue as well, to actually go also into more partnerships with the OTTs. Are we flexible and fast enough to bring our own services fast enough to the market? Well, that is the key question to ask. And unfortunately, operators carry a lot of complexity with them. Because it's so much more difficult to switch something off than it is to switch something on and bring it into our networks. And yes, we as technology people love to bring in new technology into our networks. But old technology can only be switched off when you have the last customer migrated. So I think we need a drastic change in the way we are running this business. So my first thought on how to visualize that was revolution. We need a revolution. Maybe I have too many French friends. So uh, actually, the term revolution is a little bit a scary thought. On one side, Germans haven't been very successful with revolutions. On the other side, also, it, it creates some scary feelings uh, among my American friends. So I thought, I need to find another analogy. And I grew up in the 1960s, so I was fascinated by one thing, and that was the Moonshot program. And I think we need something like a Moonshot program for the operator industry for the whole telecommunications industry now to actually master these challenges. We need some visionary people who come up with a bright idea. I think we have that. We have that in the cable industry. We have that among the fixed and mobile operators. So it's a good start. But still, re-engineering the way we are operating telecom networks, it is a massive challenge. It is a massive engineering problem until Apollo 11 could actually lift off, as you see it on this picture here, and to get finally that uh, view from the moon to the Earth. Now, how does it map to our world? I think the very first step in this, kind of the first stage of our rocket on the journey to the moon, this is the most difficult one. It's the step to simplify. How do you visualize complexity? Well, I decided to, to pick protocol bubbles to visualize complexity. They are, for technical people, something which is seen as neutral. If you put network pictures up there, everyone starts to finger point at you that uh, you're making someone look bad. So protocols are something neutral. 
Now, we carry a lot of protocols with us in our networks. We have highly modern protocols like ATM and SDH, by the time Germany was last time football world champion, which was in 1990, a long time ago. I might need to change my text hopefully next year uh, after the next football world championship. But we also carry a lot of other protocols with us. There's no doubt we will get rid of, uh, rid of ATM and SDH in the foreseeable future. But what about the IP area, for example? We're carrying three protocols in the IP area with us. IP version 4, IP version 6, and that layer 2.5 protocol called multi-protocol label switching, MPLS. Do we need all of that moving forward? So the process we started within Deutsche Telekom Group was actually to question all of these bubbles. What is actually needed to run a network in the future? And the future we're discussing, well, that's towards the end of the decade. That's not necessarily what you would do today if you build a network, but think a little bit ahead. Think, what would you do in 2017? What would you do in 2018 and beyond? How many layers in your network do you actually still need? Do you need a separate, a separate optical transmission layer if all your traffic is IP? Well, if all your traffic is IP, go and optimize the network around IP. This will make your operation much cheaper if you take out a separate op optical transport network. So we believe we can run networks in the future with just one protocol in the core. That is IP version 6. It's the full power of IPv6 with that huge address space we're bringing in, we're using here. IP version 4 will still be needed, but it's a service we are delivering in our networks. It's not in the core of our networks. Yes, we need some things around, and we need one transport protocol, and it's very clear. It's 100 gigabit Ethernet, and the technology is following there. So in the core of our networks, we are definitely moving to 100 gig E, and we just proved interoperability with, uh, between two vendors in our TerraStream pilot in Croatia using this technology. So we see that the optical transmission is integrated into our routers. The routers are driving optics. So a complete layer is taken out of the network, and that drives our cost base down. Is that an easy change? No. I think, as mentioned before, this is the most complex part, simplifying. And many people actually question this and doubt that this step is really possible. So we have proven it. We've built a, a pilot for our new architecture called TerraStream in uh, one of the European countries, Croatia, and it's very successful. So it can be done. Now, stage two of our rocket, that was actually what Bruno presented in his keynote right here in this room a year ago. And that's the introduction of a new element into the network. And that element is called the infrastructure cloud. So it's bringing data center technologies very cl close together with the network and basically move all the complex service production to the data center instead of distributing it in various functions, for example, in the routers. So the blue boxes here, they are symbolizing services we need to have the network up and running. And there are very important steps as well on the migration towards such a new architecture. Like, for example, for the foreseeable future, you might still need the concept of broadband remote access routers, BRAS, and you can actually virtualize those as well. You can virtualize all of the networking functions, even up to a packet core, for example, for mobile. And it's amazing what happened in the industry in the past year. So together with other operators, uh, we pushed for the formation of a new industry study group within Etsy called Network Function Virtualization. And this activity is hugely successful. Because if DT would have pushed alone for this, honestly, we would have failed. But as all operators really pushed for this, initially 13 when we launched this a year ago, but now it's basically all operators around the globe contributing there, and all the vendors now following this concept as well. So it is happening. Well, stage three of our rocket, that's another important one, and that's addressing the legacy we have in the operational support systems. And many of my operator colleagues will sure 
confirm that this is the biggest pain for us as operators, because we have so much legacy in there that it is very difficult to bring new services to market. Now, there's a new paradigm called software-defined networking. And this is, in fact, mapping directly to this OSS area. Many people misunderstand SDN. Our goal as operators is actually not to program our routers and switches. The vendors are actually able to do that. I need open interfaces. I need ways to program services without re-architecting the network. So we took a route inside our terrestrial stream architecture. We are modeling our services in a high-level language. And that's the ITF standard language called Yang. We're also modeling the network in the same language, so we're getting rid, for example, of element managers in our network. And we're using one standard protocol called NetConf, also developed in the ITF, to access our devices. And yes, we are open to using, for example, OpenFlow, developed by the Open Networking Foundation in the future when it's ready for mass market consumption, also outside of the data centers. So what gets us to the moon is, I think, putting these three things together. And none of these areas are simple things to solve. The simplification, well, difficult as mentioned, because it's difficult to give up things. The network function virtualization, it's a change for the whole industry, moving from hardware to software business models. And likewise, combining that with a new control paradigm. That sounds like Mission Impossible, and that's why it's so important that we execute and actually prove that it is possible to execute these three changes at the same time. When Kennedy announced that the US is flying to the, mu to the moon in the early 60s, people also thought it would not be possible. So it is possible, and it happened on uh, 21st of July, 1969. So let's make the same thing happen in the operator industry. Now, that has a huge impact. It has an impact on our teams that move to the software-defined operator. Our teams are typically structured in silos. Now, if you look ar across the fence at internet companies, the Googles, the Facebooks of this world, they don't have these silos. They actually have people who can do network engineering, network architecture, uh, who have data center skills, who have programming skills, and who have operational skills. And that is something actually we have to adopt as well for our teams. So this is by far, I would say, the biggest impact on the operators that we have to bring in new skill set combinations that we have to staff our teams in a completely different way. This is also related to processes. Let's admit it, our processes are still the old standard waterfall processes in many areas. And this is just taking too long. We can't afford the complexity of the processes. So we need to move to agile processes, and everything we built for TerraStream was actually executed in an agile process. Now, this also has an impact on the teams because we have to bet on small, empowered teams. It is no longer a very hierarchical decision chain we're working on. But really, the main point I'd like to make is actually it triggers a change on the vendor side as well. We can't drive it alone as the operators. It's a massive change for our vendors to move from a hardware-orientated margin model, even though they are delivering software on this hardware, to a pure software delivery model. Now, at the same time, we still need hardware. If you are aggregating hundreds or thousands of 100 gigabit Ethernet circuits in the future, you need a decent box, a decent router, which can do that in an energy efficient way. Because we can't build a power plant next to each core office. So we have to reduce power consumption, and that's where we need hardware leadership as well. But this opens new opportunities for the vendors as well. On one side, drive towards a software business model and virtualization, on the other side, keep the hardware leadership. With that, I'd like to close and thank all of you.